Okay, last Friday we have tackled some instrumentation we use in the laboratory. Okay. The first one is the centrifuge. Okay. We have the tabletop centrifuge. This is a mechanical centrifuge. The highest RPM RPM we have with this kind of centrifuge is up to 5000 RPM or rotation per minute. Okay. The second type is the digital. It is slightly bigger than the the mechanical um, centrifuge we have. This also can handle more specimens than the first one, this one, okay? And it has a digital output. What's the difference between the first centrifuge I have shown you and this one, okay? Ultra centrifuge is bigger, not only in size but in capacity, okay? It is as big as the washing machine. It cannot be a tabletop <laughs> centrifuge anymore, okay? Ultra centrifuge is an advanced and sophisticated centrifuge that runs at a high rate and is able to separate smaller molecules that can be separated from traditional centrifuge. Okay, it has rotor inside that can vary between 60,000 and 150 RPM or rotation per minute. Okay, uh, ultra centrifuge tend to be used in laboratories that are more well equipped to carry out more sophisticated operations. They are bigger in size and operate samples in group as continuous flow systems. The majority of centrifuge are refrigerated in order to reduce the heat caused by the increased speed. Okay? This kind of centrifuge ha has a refrigerator inside and it is usually ref temp which is between 2 Degree, 2 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? But the principle, what is the principle of ultracentrifugation? The process of working in an ultracentrifuge relies on the sedimentation principle. It stipulates that the more dense particles are more likely to settle in comparison to less dense particles in gravity. However, the process of sedimentation for particles in gravity would require more time which is the result an additional force is employed to assist in the process of sedimentation. In an ultracentrifuge, the specimen is rotated around an axis. This results in a force perpendicular to the axis known as centrifugal force, which is a force that affects various particles in the sample. Okay, So, we have two main uh, principles used in a centrifuge. The law of centrifugal force and the um, sedimentation okay okay next electrophoresis electrophoresis is a laboratory technique used to separate dna rna or protein molecules based on their size and electrical charge an electric current is used to move the molecules to be separated through a gel force in the gel work like a sieve allowing smaller molecules to move faster than larger molecules. The conditions during electrophoresis can be adjusted to separate molecules as desired size range. Okay, principle. Okay, you can see there, um, there's a power supply that supplies um, power to the anode or positive electrode and the cathode or the negative electrode and it is suspended in a liquid medium. Okay, the principle, when charged molecules are placed in an electric field, like that on the picture, okay, they migrate toward either the positive or negative pole according to their charge. In contrast to proteins, which can have either a net positive or net negative charge, nucleic acid have a consistent negative charge impaired by their phosphate backbone and migrate toward the anode. If you introduce a sample which has... Um, cation or positively charged molecules, you can identify that because they will migrate toward the cathode. Okay, and uh, we have two types of electrophoresis. The first image you see on your left side is a uh, is an example of a vertical electrophoresis. Why vertical? Because on the topmost part, the 
cathode is located and then the, the, the bottom the anode is located when a mixture of proteins is inserted into the well in a gel it identifies accordingly whether it's an anodal or a cathodal okay okay the uh, picture on your right was a horizontal electrophoresis why horizontal because the position of the cathode and the anode is adjacent to one another so the movement will be horizontal okay that is a schematic diagram of a typical electrophoresis apparatus showing two buffer boxes with buffer plates labeled as number one and then the electrophoretic support labeled as two there okay number three the wicks and then fifth is the power supply okay size exclusion chromatography okay in size exclusion chromatography we have the large particles and then the small particles okay large particles cannot enter gel and are excluded they have less volume to traverse and a lot sooner small particles can enter gel and have more volume to traverse they elute later from the name itself size exclusion it is excluded through sizes okay, size exclusion chromatography also known as gel filtration because it uses gel is the mildest of all chromatography techniques size exclusion chromatography separates molecules by differences in size as they pass through a resin packed in a column okay as you can see in the picture what is the principle of size exclusion chromatography okay imagine particles of different sizes elute through a stationary phase at a different rates this results in the separation of a solution of particles based on size. Size exclusion chromatography separates molecules based on their size by filtration through a gel. The gel consists of spherical beads containing pores of a specific size distribution. Separation occurs when molecules of different sizes are included or excluded from the pores within the matrix. Okay, That is um, shown in the image the green ones are being excluded while the smaller ones are being eluted inside the gel okay we have spectrophotometry it consists of a light source collimator a monochromator a wavelength selector sample solution detector and a digital display or meter from the light source the light is emitted through the collimator and then the monochromator or the prism will also bounce back lights with different wavelengths and then it will go through the sample so that the detector or the photocell will detect or identify what is being detected on the sample and then the output will be displayed on a digital display or a meter this is um, based on the principle of beer lambert's law okay what is the beer lambert's law it is the absorbance of a solution is directly proportional to the concentration of the absorbing material present in the solution and path length okay okay next that is the a picture of a spectrophotometer okay okay let's go to spectroscopy Spectroscopy is generally defined as the area of science concerned with the absorption, emission, and scattering of electromagnetic radiation by atoms and molecules, which may be in the gas, liquid, or solid phase. Visible electromagnetic radiation is called light, although the terms light, radiation, and electromagnetic radiation can be used interchangeably. There are three basic types of spectroscopy. Atomic absorption spectroscopy atomic emission spectroscopy and atomic fluorescence spectroscopy what is the principle of spectroscopy okay spectroscopy deals with the production measurement and interpretation of spectra arising from the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter atomic absorption spectroscopy detects elements in either liquid or solid samples through the application of characteristic wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation from the light source itself what is the light source is here okay we have the halo cathode lamp and then through the atomizer 
and the, that has nebulizer in it that is connected to the sample. Okay, individual elements will observe wavelengths they rep differently and these absorbance are measured against standards. Okay, as we measure samples, we use standards to compare whether the sample is, or the machine rather, is functional, okay? When you run the standards through the machine and then it gives you a, a value that is within the normal range or the abnormal control, then you still can use the machine, okay? Para siyang uh, detector whether your machine is still usable or tama pa ba yung binabato niyang resulta. That's why we use a standard. So, saan natin kinukuha yung standard? Usually, standard is being given by the company of the reagents we use. Okay? And then, we have the fluorescent spectroscopy. Fluorescent spectroscopy is, refers to a type of a spectroscopic method where the fluorescence from the object of interest is measured after excitation with the beam of light, usually ultraviolet spectra. The laser in this fluorescence has been used for vegetative studies, such as to monitor stress levels and physiological states in plants. Okay? Two types of fluorescence, blue-green fluorescence in about 400 to 600 nanometer range and chlorophyll fluorescence in about 650 to 800 nanometer range are produced by green leaves. That, those were examples of fluorescence. Okay? It is also used to monitor nutrient deficiencies, environmental condition-based stress levels, and diseases in plants. Okay? Next, mass spectroscopy. Okay? Mass spectroscopy is a powerful analytical technique used to quantify known materials, to identify unknown compounds within a sample, and to el elucidate the structure and chemical properties of different molecules. The complete process involves the conversion of the sample into gaseous ions with or without fragmentation, which are then characterized by their mass to change ratios and relative abundances. This technique basically studies the effect of ionizing energy on molecules, okay? It depends upon chemical reactions in the gas phase in which sample molecules are consumed during the formation of ionic and neutral species. Okay, next, we have X-ray crystallography. Okay, what is X-ray crystallography? It is a powerful non-destructive technique for determining the molecular structure of a crystal. X-ray crystallography uses the principle of X-ray diffraction to analyze the sample. But it is done in many different directions so that the 3D structure can be built up. It is a technique that has helped to deduce the 3D crystal structure of many materials, especially biological materials. Okay, The principle of X-ray crystallography involves X-ray tube, and then an X-ray brim, then the crystal itself, then the shield, okay? And then at the back, we have the photographic plate. X-rays are generated from an X-ray tube, the first, the first component there, then filtered so that they are monochromatic, okay? For example, a single wavelength frequency, the atoms in a crystal X refract the X-rays elastically scattered onto a detector. Because they are elastically scattered, they have the same energy as the incident X-rays that are fired at the sample. This generates a 2D diffraction pattern of the crystal in a single orientation. Okay? What's next? Nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It's another type of a spectroscopy. Okay? NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance Spectroscopy is the study of molecules by recording the interaction of radio frequency, electromagnetic radiations with the nuclei of molecules placed in the strong magnetic field. Okay, what is the principle? Many nuclei have spin and all nuclei are electrically charged according to NMR principle. An energy transfer from the base energy to a higher energy level is achievable 
when an external magnetic field is supplied. Okay, next we have calorimetry. Calorimetry is the measurement of the transfer of heat into or out of a system during a chemical reaction or physical process. Okay, a calorimeter is an insulated container that is used to measure heat changes. Okay, ginagamit siya para sa pagsukat ng heat change. Okay, if there's a heat change then, calorimetry will measure it as to the majority of reactions that can be analyzed in a calorimetry experiment are either liquids or aqueous solutions. A frequently used and inexpensive calorimeter is a set of nested foam cups fitted with the lid to limit the heat exchange between the liquid in the cup and the air in the surroundings. Okay, what's the principle? The body at a higher temperature releases heat while the body at a lower temperature absorbs heat. The principle of calorimetry indicates the law of conservation energy. For example, the total heat lost by, a hot, by the hot body is equal to the total heat gained by the cold body. Okay? They are inversely proportional. Okay, next we have electron microscopy. Uh, electron microscopy is a technique for obtaining high-resolution images of biological and non-biological specimen. It is used in biomedical research to investigate the detailed structure of tissues, cells, organelles, and macromolecular complexes. So that's the difference of electron microscope in a clinical microscope. Okay? The high resolution of electron microscopy images result from the use of electrons, which have very short wavelength, as the source of illuminating radiation. Electron microscopy is used in conjunction with a variety of ancillary techniques. For example, thin sectioning, thin sectioning from tissues, okay? or immunolabeling. What is immunolabeling? Those are, for example, immunocomplexes or immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin E, immunoglobulin D, immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M, and so on and so forth. Okay? Another example of the use of electron microscopy is for negative staining. So, what is negative staining? Okay? Negative staining employs the use of an acidic stain. And due to repulsion between the negative charges of the stain and the bacterial surface, the dye will not penetrate the cell. In negative staining, the results yield a clear cell with a dark background. Usually, we use the negative stain in hard-to-stain bacteria or microorganisms for us to see it in a microscope. But when you look at it in the microscope, it is colorless. Usually, it is seen in a black background with white staining. Okay? That's how negative stain looks like. There are two types of electron microscope. The first one is the transmission electron microscope. It's used to view the thin specimens or tissue sections, molecules, etc. through which electrons can pass generating a projection image. The transmission electron microscopy is analogous in many ways to the conventional compound light microscope or the clinical microscope. Okay? Where do we usually use this? We use this in histopathology. Okay? TEM is used among other things to image the interior cells, interior of cells in thin sections, the structure of protein molecules contrasted by metal shadowing, the organization of molecules in viruses, and cytoskeletal filaments. Okay? Also, that is also prepared by negative staining technique. What is the, the second type of electron microscope? The scanning electron microscope. A type of microscope which uses a focused beam on electrons to scan a surface of a sample to create a high solu resolution image. Okay. Scanning electron microscope images that can show information on a material surface, composition, and topography. Scanning Electron microscope produces magnified detailed images of an object by scanning a focused beam of electrons. Okay, what is the principle? 
Electrons are such small particles that, like photons in light, they act as waves. A beam of electrons passes through the specimen, then through a series of lenses that magnify the image. The image results from scattering of electrons by atoms in the specimen. Next, we have another type of microscopy is atomic force microscopy. Atomic force microscopy is a powerful technique that enables the imaging of almost any type of surface, including polymers, ceramics, composites, glass, and biological samples. Atomic force microscopy is used to measure and localize many different forces, including adhesion, strength, magnetic forces, and mechanical properties. AFM consists of a sharp tip that is approximately 10 to 20 nanometer in diameter, which is attached to a cantilever. Okay, what's the principle? Surface sensing. One of the principles of atomic force microscope is surface sensing okay next we have optical tweezer what is an optical tweezer it is a device that uses light from a low wattage laser to manipulate individual molecules within cells optical tweezers can be used to apply precise and much localized optical forces to microscopic particles Using only light, optical tweezers is able to influence the motion of objects in a non-contact way, as well as the inside optically transparent cells or living organisms. Okay, it's like a laboratory tweezer. Okay, what is a tweezer? It's it's chane. It's like an a chane na made up of light from low wattage laser. Okay, we can manipulate individual molecules using this tweezer. Imagine that. Um, it, how, how small is the organs of a cell or particles, microscopic particles in the body, in the human body or the particles in any specific sample we have without having to touch it physically. Okay? What is the principle of optical tweezers? Optical tweezers are based on the principle of light carrying momentum proportional to its energy and propagation direction. When a laser beam passes through an object, it bends and changes direction, called refraction, and alters its momentum. Okay? Its principle is refraction. Okay, next we have voltage clamp. What is a voltage clamp na naman? The voltage clamp naman is a technique used to control the voltage across the membrane of a small or isopotential area of a nerve cell by an electronic feedback circuit. The voltage is normally stepped to a family of levels matching preset command patterns and current supplied of absorbed by the circuit to hold the voltage at each level is measured. This current is equivalent to the ionic current flowing across the membrane in response to the voltage step. In the image on your screen, we have a, a squid giant axon that is a part of a squid. Intracellular recording electrode and then the current passing electrode. We have an ampere meter in the middle. Okay. Then from that intracellular recording electrode, we have membrane potential amplifier. Then it also has to pass by an extracellular reference electrode. Okay, that is connected outside naman the cell of the I outside naman the part of the axon. There will be the signal generator with command voltage for feedback amplification, and then that goes through the ampere meter. Next, what is the principle naman kaya ng voltage clamp? Okay, voltage clamp um measure the membrane potential then change the membrane potential or voltage to a desired value by adding necessary current so this naman voltage clamp uses voltage to apply force into our specimen or to our target object okay what next we have current clamp what is current clamp it is a way of recording biological voltages such as the action of an excitable cell with the microelectrode while keeping electrical current through the recording electrode it is uh, kept very small or at least constant its simplest form is a relatively low impedance microelectrode and an indifferent or 
ground. Electrodes that are connected by low resistance and low noise connections to a differential voltage amplifier. Okay? A high impedance electronic voltage follower circuit or operational amplifier. This type of recording can be used for both extracellular and intracellular recordings. Okay, typically, changes in voltage for about uh, 0.1 MV to 200 MV or millivolt. They are recorded in this manner wherein the changes in voltage lasting only a fraction of a millisecond are often recorded. The term current lamp is usually used to describe recordings from a very confined region such as a single cell. And often, it is used to mean the voltage of the inside of a single cell in comparison to the outside or an intercellular recording. Okay, next, the last one, we have patch clamp. What is a patch clamp naman? It is a specialist version of the voltage clamp. Almost the same sila. The patch clamp micropipette has an open tip for the diameter of about 1 micron with a polished surface rather than a sharp point. This patch pipette is pressed against a cell surface and suction is applied to the inside of the pipette to pull the cell's membrane inside its tip. Okay, the suction causes the pipette to form a tight seal with the cell membrane and with the cell's membrane with an electrical resistance of several giga ohms. The patch clamp circuit uses a single operational amplifier in the current voltage configuration to control the voltage and measure the current across the patch. Okay, it is usually used in medical operations to hold on to smallest parts of the nerve. Okay, as you can see in the image, that is a nerve. Then uh, that is the pipe, the pipette. Okay, the box here. You have the, the box here. You can, as you can see, the pipette's tip has no pointed end. Okay, because the end is supposed to be suctioning that part of the neuron. Okay, and then here on the second. You can see a tight contact between the pipette and the membrane. That is how it looked like. That's how it looked like. They cut through the cytoplasmic domain so it will be accessible. That is used to expose air. Okay? A strong pulse here. A strong pulse of suction. Cytoplasm is continuous with pipette inferior, interior here. Then the pipette retracts back to the surface the ends of the membrane <laughs> anneal here that's how patch clamp works okay that's the end of our discussion about instrumentation we have in biophysics